So we've got a general idea of what's going on, where we are, what's happening, right? Let's talk a little bit now about the people. If we can get down to the types of people that were called to service on that day and in this war. And I know some of you may have personal stories. Some of you may have personal experiences. I don't know. But let's talk about the nature of the people, the, the men. And I guess there were some women involved in some in some. But let's talk a little bit about who were the people that were behind the day. Yes, and the you're soldiers. talking about the troops that assaulted yes, the beaches. Yes, the soldiers, yes. Yeah, so people. I think when we remember, and, and Joyce, that's such a good question because we often remember these things in history in terms of timelines and this amount of troops and that amount of aircraft, and we lose sight of the humanity. Right. And, uh, and, and I know my fellow combat vets here will attest to the fact that a lot of times the humanity is just forgotten. And when you think about the troops that assaulted these beaches, these are 18-year-olds, these are 19-year-olds, these are very young men in a lot of cases. And uh, these are guys who, I remember when I went to basic training, you're out there in formation with, in my case, was the cavalry. So there's an entire squadron mm -hmm. of cav troops. And they tell you, like, there's people in this formation that are not going to make it. Like, some of you will not make it. And so these guys who knew each other so well, who were young, um, and they're seeing their friends, uh, which when you're in combat together, there's this deep and close camaraderie and brotherhood. It's like losing a family member. It genuinely, right. if you can imagine losing multiple family members every single day, uh, this is what th this would have felt like. And that yet they're pressing on and they're going into combat and they're being shot at and they're still pushing forward. Just an immense amount of bravery uh, that, that gets forgotten, but also the humanity and just the heartbreaking you know, part of just losing co comrades and brothers in arms. And I would mm. like to hear uh, your, your uh, opinion on this as well. There are three types of people in combat. The first group was on a first round goes zipping past your head, and it sounds like zip yeah. unless it hits somebody in the head, and then it sounds like a watermelon being dropped on a concrete floor. Okay? That group is scared beyond belief. I was one of that group. The second group mentally cancels out. They just, they cannot, they just can't get behind it. And then the third group likes it. Now, I was involved in special operations sitting in Laos in 1968-69 when we weren't even admitting to being there, okay? I can tell you stories about scared, but the thing was, none of the people I worked with, and it was uh, Green Berets and Special Op, uh, MACV, Navy SEALs, and uh, all this, the clandestine groups, okay? None of the people liked killing. And they didn't fight for the flag, or the, they fought for the guy next to them. Mm. So, you know. Well, that, that's another thing. The, the sense of what you were fighting for, I mean, that had to be very clear. They knew what had happened in Europe. Well, right? that's also, this could, be, this could get political, and I don't want to go in that direction, but those young people back in those days were brought up to love America. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it seems, unfortunately, they're brought up to question America. I think your father was, uh, yes, go ahead, talk about your. My father enlisted in 1943. He was 18 years old. In fact, <laughs> all of his brothers, just about, they had their own band of brothers, went in and um, they weren't drafted. They enlisted because that was what they did. They loved our country. There was an enemy out there. They were not warfaring people, um, but they did what had to be done. Um, they were not outrageously brave people. <laughs> they were men who were young and went out to do what had to be done for a country that was their country. Um, some of my uncles were injured. All of my uncles came back and my father. My father never talked about the war, but he had taken a lot of photos. He was in the Mediterranean. He took a lot of pictures. Um, and my other uncle, his brother, was a photographer, and he was there as a photographer, part of his mission. So I do have some of his photos that he took. But what I can tell you is that my father was a rather stoic German man. And I never saw much emotion from my father, although he was a loving father. And my parents lost four children to stillborn and miscarriage. And I think they must have, he must have kept his emotions from my mother on that. 
So I've never seen my father cry until I took them, both of my parents, to the World War II memorial when it was finally unveiled. And he wore his World War II cap. And people came up to him and said, thank you, and he cried. Mm. It was the most touching thing I've ever seen, and I will never forget how he felt about that. And then he was fortunate enough to also be taken on one of the um, Southwest. Um, they were taking World War II vets to the uh, exhibit, and they did all kinds of wonderful things. They did a mail call on the planes. They had the uh, stewardesses dressed up like the uh, singers and everything from way back then. It was the ultimate experience mm. for these older men who How were very old was few. was he when he went through that? How many years had um, been? Well, my dad just died four years ago, and he was 90. And um, he had just started with Louis Bodies, and we were very fortunate. This happened right as that started. So it was about six years ago. Okay. So he was 80s. clear enough, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And it was just an incredible experience for me. I'm so grateful that Southwest has done that. Um, but it was a different, it was so different because these men were exactly as you said. They went to serve their country. They were proud of it. And I, know, I don't intend to get political, but I will tell you, <laughs> there are many, many days I am thankful that my father is no longer alive to see what is happening now in our country. They went and they fought and they were very brave and men died to keep the type of militarism that is happening today. And I'm, it sounds sad, but I'm glad he's not around to see what's happening Rich, now. Rich, I think you wanted to have a comment. Yes, mm -hmm. I'd like to look at this from a different perspective. People must keep in mind that the military was segregated up to July 26, 1948. So when uh, many, many, many African Americans wanted to serve the country, and as they lined up to serve the country, they were given minimum jobs. Basically, they didn't have a lot of combat jobs. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the jobs they had in the Navy was cooks, things of, things of, that, things of that nature. So when you go back and you look at it, and my father experienced it, <coughs> yet he went and he served the country, which many African Americans did, mm -hmm. but they came back home to segregation. I was talking to a gentleman that served with the Tuskegee Airmen, and he said, and when they got back to New York, the sign said whites, the other said colors. And that tells me the most important thing is, and I think people need to understand, African Americans have always loved this country, and has always served this country. And we fought for the right of other people when we weren't getting the same treatment in America. Now you and said your father mm -hmm. served, he w what did he serve in what capacity? He was in the army, he was a, ended up being a mess sergeant, which a mess most blacks and very few okay. African Americans served in combat. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of them. Now people don't talk about the 320th anti-aircraft battalion, balloon battalion. They were on D-Day. Their job was to float these balloons up so that the aircraft could not come down and, and shoot them up. Nobody never talks about them. Well, nobody well let's never talk about it now. Well, Tell me about it. Nobody never talks Tell about me, yeah. the 327 quartermaster service, uh -huh. which is basically the supplies and moving material, but they were responsible for moving the bodies. Uh, the point is this here. If you think about the seven... If you think about the 761st Tank Battalion, which is known as the Black Panthers, if you go back and you look at history, Patton gave them a speech telling them how important it was for them to serve in this country and be proud so that blacks across this country would be very supportive of them. And I, I think that's the ironical part when we talk about history. I watched the Patton movie. There was no blacks in Patton. The only black that you saw in the Patton movie with George C. Scott was an aide. That's mm. all you saw. You didn't see any more. And if you talk about the longest yards, they have never depicted African Americans in World War II movies. Now keep that in mind, understanding that we love the country and a lot of people gave their lives. 
-hmm. And it's always gone unnoticed. So clearly, there were, there were dedicated and patriotic African Americans who participated as best they were allowed to do in World War II and in this. Did you, I'm sorry, you wanted to say something? One of the things involving black soldiers in World War II was what came later with the civil rights marches and things like this. The genie was already out of the bottle because when black men and some women who served in the army and military in general, when they were on the ground in France and Italy being treated totally different than they got treated back home, they wouldn't settle mm. for less. Mm -hmm. So it cha the war changed na uh, things back at home as well, yes. I would like to pick up on something that Rich said about uh, our perspective on D-Day. It wasn't just an American military invasion. It was, there were 13 nations involved. My own family happens to be Greek, and my mother's youngest brother was in the invasion. He landed on Utah Beach. He was trained as a ranger. He survived. He went on to the port of Cherbourg, which they cleared, and then he was killed in St. Lowe, France. Mm. My family treasures his memory. But my point to pick up on what Rich said is there were other nations involved. There was a Greek naval ship in the D-Day invasion. The Poles were there. The Czechs were there. The Belgians were there. All the people from Europe trying to get back to their homeland were part of the D-Day invasion. Not all of them ground troops, many of them in naval operations, and yet that was so incredibly important. I mean, if we ever get into discussions of the logistics of D-Day, it is staggering that anybody could even manage that. But I think sometimes, as Americans, we glorify D-Day as our personal success story. And I think, as Eisenhower tried to put together an allied team, if you want to call it that, the allied command was made up of 13 nations. And he worked very hard to make them not think of just their own nation as the winners or losers or separate units what we call stovepipes today, he wanted them all to think of themselves as part of the Allied Command.